Hi, my name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. A little later in this episode, uh, you're going to see me working on a space shuttle orbiter. And uh, I'm going to use the opportunity to talk about how to design the orbiter of a space shuttle. And also talk about re-entering uh, such a, well a space plane really, right? How do you bring a space plane and get it back down onto the runway? So all of that's going to be for a little bit later in the video. Right here though, right now, what we have is MOHO-1. MOHO-1 I launched a couple of episodes ago and it's been sitting in a parking orbit waiting for its transfer window out to, well, MOHO. And so what you're seeing me here do is do that, uh, that escape burn to get it onto a trajectory on its way out to MOHO. Now in that episode that I put this thing into orbit, I spent quite a bit of time talking about, uh, MOHO transfers and how much they should cost and I am planning on putting this into an orbit around MOHO and how much that capture should cost but I also talked a little bit about how it can be a little bit unpredictable so this is now the moment of truth this is now to see how much is this really going to cost me now this burn is 1494 meters per second and that is predicted to get me an intercept with MOHO uh, that's substantially less than what most Delta V maps predict. Most Delta V maps has the burn at about 1,710 meters per second. But the reason for that is because I am catching MOHO's orbit pretty close to its apoapsis, as you can see here. But what celestial mechanics giveth, celestial mechanics taketh away. Um, and the reason for that is, is when you go to perform your capture, you really are um, matching up with MOHO's orbit, the, the orbit that you're trying to capture. So because I am hitting MOHO at its apoapsis, the capture burn is going to cost me more because I have to get my resulting orbit. Remember, I'm going to be orbiting with MOHO when this is all done. My resulting orbit uh, down to the same as uh, MOHO's periapsis, which means that that capture is going to cost more. Now, it doesn't cost them much, as much as simply inserting myself into MOHO's orbit, because MOHO is giving me a hand. <laughs> as I come into MOHO's sphere of influence, I'm going to be dragged in along with MOHO, and I'm going to get some Oberth effect happening as well, but the, the fact is, it's still going to cost me more. And that's what got me realizing geez you know I am also coming in with a seven degree inclination difference that can't be ignored either but let's see what this burn actually ends up costing me in the end oh geez oh yes what did I do there I hit Z again instead of X to cut my burn so I ended up overcooking this a little bit and while I try and correct for that mistake that I made there which I have quickly end up abandoning because uh, I just rely on I'm, I'll just do a correction burn which is you know some middle orbit correction burn that uh, I would have had to have probably have done anyway uh, why don't we talk a little bit of what the predictions should be so the um, Delta V map that I have predicts that the entire escape and capture moho should cost me 4,120 meters per second. My escape burn actually cost me 1,494 meters per second, so that means that uh, my capture, according to the Delta V map, should be about 2,626 meters per second. So what I ended up doing is I set up that correction burn, got myself my encounter, I ended up with about a uh, 28 meter per second correction burn and then I thought you know what let's just see you know let's set up a maneuver node and actually see what this capture is going to cost okay so we'll put the maneuver node there at my periapsis my closest approach to moho uh, let's go back to precise node I enjoy precise nodes so much more than dragging those uh, node indicators around Oh, you can start to see my trajectory starting to bend. Getting closer and closer to Moho. Closer and closer to my capture here. Okay, there's my capture. A little bit more. I do want to put this into, by the way, a polar orbit. Oops, oops, that's a little too much. A polar orbit because this is going to be a mapping satellite there. That's pretty good. And what you can see here is about a 3,670 meter per second. That is about 1,040 meters per second too much. So, 
why the you know thousand plus difference in uh, what the delta v map is predicting and uh, what I ended up getting. And I'll add too that this is pretty, you know, talking with other people, this is pretty typical of what they find when they try and do captures around Moho. And uh, I also preface this by saying that I am by no stretch an expert on celestial mechanics. Uh, so what you're seeing here, what you're going to be getting here, are, is kind of my theory and as to why we seem to get these, these differences. And uh, if you have anything to add in the comments, please do. So first of all, my closest approach there was about uh, 300 kilometers. And uh, the closer you are to Moho, the cheaper your capture is going to be. So the first thing you see me doing as I'm playing or continue to play around is I bring my closest approach uh, closer to Moho. The closer you can get it, the cheaper is going to get it. And I figure it's probably about an extra two to 300 meters per second uh, was lost simply because my altitude of my encounter was so high. But I think one of the bigger ones is because my inclination coming into Moho, my uh, orbital inclination was still, there was still a seven degree difference between my trajectory coming in and the orbit of Moho. And uh, those capture calculations ignore all that, but you can't ignore all that because you do have to change the inclination of your trajectory. And I did some farting around with some numbers. I'm not going to do it because I'm not all that, or show it to you, but I'm not all, because I'm not all that confident with the really. But I figure, by my sketchy calculations, that there's probably about 330 meters per second added on to this because of that seven degree plane change that you have to make as well. Um, so all told, that's about, 600 meters per second now that I've accounted for the extra little over a thousand meters per second. The rest of it, honestly, I think has to do with a radial component to your capture. If you are not meeting your target orbit, in this case Moho's orbit, at your periapsis, that means there's going to be some radial component to your capture. You're not coming in to, to tangentially to the orbit of Moho. And that's going to happen a lot. In fact, if you go back and take a look at my encounter, uh, I wasn't coming in right at my periapsis either. So I think that accounts for a lot of these differences as well. Anyway, as I was saying, this is just a theory, but to put my theory to the test, what I did is I, I played around a bit with my uh, correction burn, um, putting in a ton of rate and a normal component in order to get my inclination uh, my relative inclination with Moho's orbit down to zero to see if I could cancel out that uh, normal predict or that uh, normal part of the capture burn. Uh, there's no way I'm going to do this because this correction burn was way more than the extra that I was spending um, in my capture before. But I thought I'd try this out just as an experiment. And as you can see here, as I'm doing my uh, my new capture burn with my my new trajectory coming in, suddenly this capture. 4,670 meters per second. I mean, this is ridiculous. The reason why? Well, we'll zoom out here and you'll see I am not even close to encountering Moho's orbit tangentially. You can see there um, that I have a significant radial angle. And that radial angle is adding more than 1,000 meters per second to my capture. I mean, really, what I should be doing is I should be meeting Moho's orbit, you know, right around here. But I am way off from that, and that is making this expensive. And don't forget that uh, my inclination with Moho's orbit is now pretty close to zero. So this is nothing to do with inclination changes. This is purely that that the radial component of that capture. So if you want to make your capture as cheap as you can, make sure to encounter that orbit as close as tangential. As you can. Well, anyway, enough of that. Let's get on to space planes. Well, space shuttles, really, right? Uh, this will never take off off of the runway. The idea is to strap on a whole stack of boosters and launch it vertically, just like the U.S. space shuttle used to do, and then have this thing land um, on the runway again, like the U.S. space shuttle used to do. Um, but I'm going to talk about the old launching and strapping on the boosters at a later. This one's just going to be about the design of the orbiter and about 
how to land the thing. And this is going to be a cargo carrier, so I'm going to attach on a couple of the, these cargo bays. That does not seem big enough, so I'll, I'll double it up a little bit. This is my biggest cargo bay. And we'll put some, uh, some fuel on there. And uh, let's see, we'll find a couple of appropriate engines to put on the back. Uh, where are they? Yeah, these guys I think we'll do here. That'll look, I think, pretty good to get us started. Now, I do want to make sure that that cargo bay is big enough to carry my, my smaller satellites. Um, so what I did is I took one of my old, uh, my old junk sats. And uh, we're just going to drag it over here just to make sure that it's going to fit okay. Okay, okay, i got to spin it around. We'll stick this on the back. There we go. And, you know, later I'll, I'll put a docking port and stuff there so it's attached properly. Let's close the doors, make sure that no part of it is, uh, you know, clipping out. But, no, it looks pretty good there. All right, on to the next step. Now, controlling re-entry. When you, when you come in with a, a space plane or a shuttle like this, uh, a big part of it is going to be controlling the location of the center of mass. So what I like to do is put in a second fuel can, even though I don't need the fuel. And I'm going to have one towards the back. I already have that one on there with that bicoupler. You can see it. And the second one's going to go out here towards the front. And uh, that gives me a ridiculous quantity of delta V. I do not need this much fuel. But... Um, what it's going to allow me to do is to control where the center of mass is by moving the fuel forward and back. You'll see, you'll see that in action when I go to do a re-entry. Um, by the way, you can ignore those radial engines that are on there. Uh, I, I thought as I was adding parts to this that I would uh, be having an issue with thrust to weight ratio, but uh, that ended up not being the case. So those radial engines will disappear in the future. As far as lifting surfaces and control surfaces, uh, same deal as with planes, really. Um, you want to have a variety of lifting surfaces. You want uh, lifting surfaces to control roll and pitch and yaw. Uh, so this is starting to look the same. Again, you want to control the location of the center of mass. So to be quite frank, at this point, it's not too crucially important. All right, now that I'm getting this close, though, to its final mass, we can start taking out some of the fuel. So we'll take out that all of the fuel out of that forward tank. Again, that forward tank is really there to allow me to control where the center of mass is going to be. Uh, not so much for the fuel part of it. I still have over 1,100 meters per second of delta V. Uh, that's unnecessary. So let's go down here to the, to the rear tank. We'll take out about half of that. So that's that, 626 meters per second. Yeah, that's more in the ballpark of what I'm shooting for. I mean, there's still some more mass coming, including a payload, but uh, all it has to do is get itself into low curb and orbit and get itself back down, so that's plenty. Back in the cargo bay, I'm just fine-tuning the location of the docking port. Also hit a battery in here, as you can see. That'll be holding the cargo, obviously, in the future. And uh, then what I want to do, I want to hide a couple of... Uh, monoprop tanks in here. Right now the only monoprop on this thing is uh, on the cockpit and I will be needing the RCS. Let's see monoprop cans. Uh, I just think I want just the, uh, the small ones. Where are the small ones? There we are. These guys. The spherical ones. And we'll put a couple in here. Put on the radial symmetry. There it is. And we'll put those in there. And I'm, again I'm putting them towards the back. Uh, one is I do want the extra monoprop because the RCS is useful, uh, especially on re-entry. But second, I'm putting them towards the back again so I can control the location of the center of mass. I can pump monoprop back and forth now between the cockpit and those monoprop cans. Okay, we're getting pretty close to our first test flight, I think. But what we need, one last thing, are some landing gear. Now, when it comes to uh, regular planes, the advice is... To position your landing gear so that when the plane is sitting on the runway, it is slightly pitched upwards. And that's to help you take off. This guy will never take off from the runway. It's only going to land on the runway. So the advice is actually going to be the opposite now. To place the landing gear so that when it's sitting on the runway, it is pitching down slightly. So I'm going to play around with the vertical position of the landing gear. 
um, so that uh, it's I can accomplish that. And if you take a look at the real space shuttle sitting on the runway, you'll see that it is pitching down. So that way, when it gets down on the runway, there's actually a downforce on the lifting surfaces, and that helps you stick those landings and helps you uh, stop more quickly once you're down on the runway. Unfortunately, I really couldn't get those rear landing gear low enough and the front landing gear high enough without it looking stupid uh, to really get as much of a pitch down as uh, I wanted, but eh, it's okay. I, I think we're ready to give this thing a go. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use the um, simulator that's built into Kerbal Construction Time, and we're gonna run a simulation starting ourselves from an orbit of 80 kilometers. And of course we're on the night side. Well, I do have the cockpit lights, so I can turn those on at least. Uh, you know, the final product will have lights on it. I just haven't put any running lights on it just yet. Uh, there's one other thing, actually, I didn't show. There they are, is the RCS. I didn't uh, show me placing the RCS thruster blocks on this thing. Uh, I end up tweaking them anyway, and I'll show you that part uh, when I when I get back into the space pain hangar. But here I'm just testing, you know, lateral thrusting in various different directions and obviously rolling. You want to put RCS thrusters away from the center of mass, so that means they are out towards the wingtips and up towards the nose at the front and way at the back by the engines. But those all seem to work fairly well. So what we're going to do is we're going to do ourselves a descent. And, oh, I'm really close to being directly opposite to where the Kerbal Space Center is, so that's good. Should be able to do our descent burn from here, so we'll point ourselves retrograde, turn on the engines of course, and we're going to use the trajectories mod. Now I like to enter the atmosphere with a space plane in full belly flop mode. That means with an angle of attack of about 90 degrees. Just coming in straight, pointing straight up. And so let's see, we'll put it up in the high atmosphere at 90 degrees because I do like to hold my that attitude as long as I can. And then I end up pointing it down to a pitch of zero. That's sort of the idea. So we'll thrust in a retrograde direction. And we'll watch for that cross that comes from the trajectories mod. And I want to put that cross straight on top of the Kerbal Space Center. That ought to do it. Okay. So we'll turn off trajectories, don't need that anymore. Um, I want to simulate kind of going in like I just completed a mission. So I'm going to drain off a lot of the fuel here, like we just did some orbital maneuvering. So liquid fuel oxidizer, it's that bicoupler that's the one at the back. So I'm going to drain out all of that fuel and oxidizer. And I'm draining that one because normally what I would do is I want the center of mass to be as far forward as it can be. So I would normally take all of the liquid fuel and oxidizer and pump it to, uh, to that forward tank. That's the tank that's ahead of the cargo bay. And of course we're just going to time warp around. So why don't we just cut to uh, me I don't know, maybe about midway through my re-entry. So we've just passed the 55 kilometer mark, and I realized some time before this that uh, I am going to completely overshoot the Kerbal Space Center. I'm right now over that continent that the Kerbal Space Center is on. It's on, it's on the coast that I'm heading towards, and there's no way I'm going to come down in time for that. Uh, yeah, I, should, I wasn't paying enough time, attention to my periapsis. It was way too high. I was too much dependent on the trajectories mod. Um, I, I, I think high atmosphere, pro, it, must, it, it obviously starts at 18 kilometers and up, and I won't be able to hold this attitude right down to 18 kilometers. So that's why uh, trajectories got messed up, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll do better next time. I also have the RCS on now. As you can see, I'm using RCS to help me hold this attitude. I want to, again, I'm trying to increase or hold my, you know, maximize my drag as long as possible, but it's getting more and more difficult. The plane wants to flip forward. And again, it's flipping forward because I have the center of mass so far forward compared to the center of lift. And that's a good thing. You want it to flip forward nose first, not flip backwards. 
I'm going to hold this as long as I can, but uh, you know, at some point I won't be able to hold it anymore. And also at some point the uh, heating is going to become too severe that even if I could hold it, I won't want to. And that point is coming pretty soon. <laughs> it's amazing how well the RCS can still hold it there. It really wants to go forward. I am pitched all the way back. If you take a look at my pitch indicator, you'll see that. But it is slowly going forward. Still holding pretty good. I'm still up, what, about 45 kilometers up, so the heating's still not too bad. I'm keeping an eye on my monopropellant as well, though I do have quite a lot on this particular vessel because I knew I would be doing this. And uh, the big thing about descending a space plane, the big, the big secret to it, is controlling that vertical speed. You do not want that vertical speed to be too high as you get into the thicker part of the atmosphere. So right now, yeah, I'm giving up on trying to hold that attitude. And what I want to do is generate some lift now. Now that I'm biting into the actual atmosphere, I'm trying to generate some lift and I'm looking at that vertical speed indicator. You can either look at the indicator that's up there beside the uh, altimeter, stock vertical speed indicator, or you can take a look at Kerbal Engineer, which is telling me now that I'm in around about 195 meters per second down from my vertical speed, which is entirely too high. I definitely do not want to be going down into the atmosphere with that kind of vertical speed. That's going to cause me heating and explody type issues. So I'm keeping myself pitched up. I'm still using the RCS to try and generate lift, and I can see that my vertical speed is going down. I want it definitely a lot lower than that. I've also, as you probably noticed, uh, stepped up the video playback speed to two times speed uh, because this takes a long time. Yeah, one of the, I think, annoying things about space planes, and then probably I would use them more if it wasn't for this, it's just so much easier to uh, drop a capsule from, from low curve in orbit and deploy the parachutes, and you're down and just you know, a few minutes and that's it, it's done. The landing a space plane takes more time, but it is a satisfying thing to do. Oh, my, spa oh, my speed's down to 70 meters per second, so this is working well. Yeah, you want to control that vertical speed. It's controlling that vertical speed that allows you to control just how much heating your space plane is going to take down now about minus 35 meters per second this is just excellent and I'm noticing now that the atmosphere is actually doing something and biting into those control surfaces that I am too nose heavy so I'm gonna take a look at the liquid fuel and I'll start pumping some of it back there we go and I'm just sort of feeling what the controls are like as I'm doing that there that's good I'm not gonna bother moving the oxidizer oops so turn that stuff all off there we go now the plane feels a lot a lot better. So you can actually, you know, pump it back and forth until it feels about right. And now it's time to <laughs> see if I can turn around. And you know, the other thing too about space planes, other than then taking a long time to get down compared to capsules, they don't save you any money either when it comes to putting payloads into orbit. Let's see if I can change. Let's go. Oh, that's better. I just added pitch to the uh, airlines on the wings. And that that has really helped. I'm now actually turning myself around. So I'm going to keep that that way. I'm going to have those uh, control surfaces at the back actually help with pitch as well. Anyway, as I was saying, um, these things don't even really save you money, uh, space planes. It's cheaper for you to use lifters to put car cargo into space than space planes. It is at this point that I've completely abandoned the idea of getting back to the Kerbal Space Center. That just isn't going to happen. Ooh, the view from the cockpit's a little scary. <laughs> Alrighty, so we'll just glide down and we're just gonna ditch it in the water. And I'm gonna try and ditch it in the water and not break anything. Play a little bit again with the position of the center mass. Get this thing feeling a little bit better. That's better. Nice. 1,500 meters from the surface. Vertical speed is now about minus 35 meters per second. 
and I'm completely in control. Nowhere near the Kerbal Space Center, but completely in control. You can tell I've also I long ago turned off the RCS. Now that the air is nice and thick, I have no issues with control just from the control surfaces on the plane. I do want to not hit the water too fast. I am going at over about 110 meters per second, so a little bit of flaring there. Got my speed down to about 80 meters per second. Do that again. Nice, now it's under 70, a little bit more flaring. Just gonna keep flaring like this. You know what would be nice would be air brakes. But I completely forgot to put them on and no problem, nothing broke. If this were only on a runway, it would have been perfect. Now for a first go, that went really well, but there are some changes I want to make, starting with getting rid of these RCS blocks on those canards. And while I'm talking about RCS, I do want to show you one mod before this video runs out of time, one more mod. And this is this RCS Build Aid. This is a great mod here. It gives you lots of information about RCS, including how much Delta V you have. But what I'm interested in is how well this thing translates. So playing up and I'm looking here at the up. This is translating up. So the green arrow showing what the overall force is. You got these little blue arrows showing the force from each of the thrusters. And you can see that that green arrow is not pointing straight up. And I would very much like it to be pointing straight up, not up and forward, but just up. And I think I can fix this by adjusting this little thruster down here at the bottom. So I'm picking the rotation tool and I'm just going to adjust that thruster. Oh, overall thrust is still not quite up. Oh, I think that's a little bit too far. Come back a bit and perfect. And now I can go to the down direction. I got the same sort of problem, but this time I'm going to be adjusting the little thruster at the front. Excellent, very, very useful mod. Anyway, I continued to work on this. I kitted it out a little bit more, especially putting on some running lights and all of that, and then practiced another descent. Now, I won't show you a whole lot of this descent because uh, you saw a whole lot of the previous descent, and uh, the principles are still exactly the same. So, all I'll do is I'll reiterate my main point, which is control your vertical speed. That really is what all it's all about. Take your time, control your vertical speed. Uh, one thing I do have this time around is I do have air brakes, so that's cool. I can use air brakes to help slow myself down now. I also brought my periapsis down further uh, in my descent burn that I did previously, though I still played this a little bit too cautiously. Yeah, even with the air brakes, I couldn't slow myself down fast enough, and I ended up overshooting the runway just a little bit. But this thing flies and glides so well that perfectly in glide mode, I never once turned on the main engines. I was able to turn this thing around and come in for a nice controlled landing on the runway. And once I had this thing on the ground, I was perfectly happy with it. So what I did is I put it in the building queue, the Kerbal Construction Time building queue for the space plane hangar. I know that seems a little bit weird just to build the orbiter, but the idea is to have it be built, then recovered, and then it should be much quicker to build it a second time. And that second time is when I will be attaching it to a lifter. And that's going to be the second part of the design of building the space shuttle is building that lister, lifter and liquid fuel boosters. That's all going to have to be for a future episode. I thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.